the darkness, the veil, the earthquake, the graves opened, the bodies arise from their graves, the grave closed. Uh, we're continuing on in our study of the of the um, miracles that happened at the cross. And we've seen, first of all, the miracle of the darkness, and it very definitely was a miracle. It wasn't just a certain uh, phenomena that took place, it was a miracle. Genuine, bona fide miracle. And then we saw last week the, the uh, miracle of the veil, how the veil was supernaturally ripped in two, and we're going to be dealing with the veil again today. And um, uh, that was one of the miracles at the cross. There's six of them all together, and that's what we're doing in this series. So let's look to God in prayer, and we'll begin. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless this class time today. We ask you to bless your word and the ministering of your word. And we ask you, Lord, that you would uh, just in a, in a very special way bless each one of us as we are here together and as we study the Word of God together and, and as we consider the Lord Jesus and these miracles that we're dealing with. Lord, we just pray that his name will be high and lifted up and his glory fill this place. Now, Lord, we pray that you would uh, minister to each one of us by your Holy Spirit edify and bless your people. These things we ask and pray in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, does everybody have a lesson sheet? If you don't have a lesson sheet, hold up your hand and we'll see that you get one. Apparently everybody's got one or <laughs> doesn't want one. <laughs> okay, we're talking about the veil and we've seen the six miracles, or we are seeing the six miracles and this is the second miracle that we're dealing with. And I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles, please, to Psalm 22. Psalm 22. Last week we saw that in the tabernacle, the color scheme in the tabernacle was blue and scarlet and purple. And we saw there was spiritual lessons from these colors, and we're going to be dealing with them uh, some more again today. This thing's collapsing on me. Yeah, hopes, hopefully I'll hold. Um, the blue speaks of Jesus' deity, and because he's, from, he's the Lord from heaven, it's, it's the blue. The scarlet speaks of his humanity, the shedding of his blood. He came and shed his blood. Died for our sins. The Bible says our sins were scarlet. Isaiah 1.18, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red as crimson, they shall be as wool. And so his blood was shed for our sins. And then the purple speaks of his royalty. He's the coming king. And the color scheme within the tabernacle, the ten curtains were blue, scarlet, and purple. And the hangings were blue, scarlet, and purple. And the priest's clothing were blue, scarlet, and purple. And the ephod that the priest wore was blue, scarlet, and purple. As well as the girdle that he wore was blue, scarlet, and purple. The pomegranates hanging from the bottom of, his, of the priestly robe was blue, scarlet, and purple. His breastplate contained, with, along with some other colors, blue, scarlet, and purple, and the veil itself, and this is what we're studying, that veil that hung there between the holy place and the holy of holies, that veil was colored in blue, scarlet, and purple. All of these, this color scheme, all of these colors, they all speak of the Lord Jesus Christ. The blue, his deity, the scarlet, his humanity, and the purple, his royalty. You have the whole scope of Jesus' dealings with mankind in that color scheme. He was the Lord from heaven, hence the blue. Came, became a man and came to earth and died for our sins, hence the scarlet. And he's coming back again as the king, hence the, the purple. So the, the color scheme of the tabernacle is all about Jesus. And 
this veil that was rent in two is all about Jesus. And I got thinking this past week, where did the dyes come from that colored everything blue, scarlet, and purple? I'd never really thought about that before, but here's Israel, they cross the Red Sea, they come to Mount Sinai, God gives them the law, and then during the giving of that law, he tells them about the tabernacle. They have to build the tabernacle. They have to have the priesthood. The priesthood is established there, and uh, all of these things uh, take place, and God gives them the pattern of everything there in the wilderness. And then they begin their journey to the promised land, and this journey takes them 40 years because of their unbelief, and that tabernacle had to be packed up every morning and journey with them. And then at night it had to be unpacked and set up again. They did this for 40 years. And I got thinking, where did the dyes come from? Because all of these things in the tabernacle, the veil included, would not be blue, scarlet, and purple in their natural form. They had to have been dyed. And so I began to check. And the blue dye that was used and known in biblical times came from shellfish. They would get, get these shellfish, they uh, uh, squeeze them, and, uh, and, and blue dye was made from that. Well, right away, it, it struck me, this is a type of Christ. The shellfish is a type of Christ. They live underwater. They are unseen by the masses of humanity. You can walk along an ocean side and you are totally unaware of what's underneath that water. This is the way it was with Christ and his coming. Just think of it. The holy, sinless, immaculate Son of God, the Word of God himself, God in the flesh, God became man and came and dwelt amongst us. The Bible says, in John 1.14, the Word became flesh. And it tells us in uh, uh, 1 Timothy 3.16, it, it tells us that God was manifest in the flesh. He came and He's here. And the waters speak of the masses of humanity. But how many people living back there or even today know that Jesus came, God in the flesh, He came into this world, to save sinners. Someone was just telling me this morning, they said to somebody, uh, Jesus died for your sins, and they said, he did? Never heard that before. Wow, what a revelation. Jesus died for our sins? I thought almost everybody knew that, but apparently they don't. As if you heard Pastor Jim's message today, we're living in a pagan society. It used to be a Christian society, but it has become a pagan society, and Jesus is unseen by the masses of humanity. In John 1, 5, we read, And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. This world is so darkened by sin that they can't even recognize light when they see it. The darkness comprehended it not. Jesus is the light, and the world doesn't recognize the light. And in John 1, 10, this is a little bit stronger. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. The world, the whole world, all of creation. He is the God of creation. But the world, his own creation, knows him not. And then it becomes even stronger. John 1, 11, He came unto his own, that's the nation Israel. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. The, the uh, darkness comprehended him not. Uh, the world knew him not and his own received him not. He's unknown, basically unknown by the, to the masses of humanity. The Muslims, the pagans in Africa, the, the Hindus in India, the uh, Shintos and uh, Confucianites and so forth over there in the Orient, they know nothing about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the blue, the blue dye, dye comes from the shellfish and it speaks of the fact that the world does not know the Lord from heaven. Secondly, the scarlet comes, the scarlet dye comes from some particular forms of worms and grubs. 
And you say, is that also a picture of the Lord Jesus? And the answer is, yes, it is. His humanity is seen in the worms and the grubs from which the scarlet dye was made. Now, if you have your Bibles open, <coughs> pardon me, to Psalm 22, this is a psalm that Jesus spoke from the cross. This, this is a prophecy of what, goes, what was going on as Jesus was hanging on the cross. Notice the very first verse. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus spoke those words from the cross. And then notice, if you will, in verse 8. It says, he trusted on the Lord and he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. That's what the crowd said about Jesus at the cross. He trusted in the Lord. Let the Lord deliver him. He saved others. He cannot save himself. Then in verse 14, notice, he says, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It melted in the midst of my bowels. Those were uh, uh, the, the condition of Jesus there upon the cross. Notice there in verse 16, he says, Dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. That's a prophecy of the cross. And then in verse 18, it says, they parted my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. The Roman soldiers did that at the cross. So this is a prophecy of the cross. Now the verse we want to, uh, you to settle in on is verse 6. This is Jesus' words from the cross. I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. Jesus refers to himself in his crucified state as a worm and not a man. Well, isn't it interesting that this speaks of his humanity and the scarlet dye that speaks of his humanity came from worms. And then thirdly, the purple. There is a type of a snail called the murex snail from which purple dye came from. And undoubtedly, these Israelites, this is where they uh, got their dye from, and the, the one color within the tabernacle and on the veil there was the purple. Now, why a snail? What is there about a snail that is reminiscent of the Lord Jesus? Well, the snail is just about the slowest of all animals. You have a race between a snail and a turtle, and the turtle would win hands down. The snail is very, very small. He barely, barely moves. In his whole lifetime, he doesn't travel very far. So um, he, he's a very slow, uh, a slow animal. Jesus, the, the purple, from which the purple dye comes from these snails, speaks of Jesus in his royalty and in his kingdom. And his kingdom is on hold. He offered it and it was rejected. And today it is on hold. And the Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 4, that in the last days scoffers are going to come and they're going to say, where is the promise of his coming? He's not coming back if he'd have been here by now. Why is he so slow in coming back? Where's the promise of his coming? I had, I've had Christians say to me, well, I don't know about the second coming. You know, I've been hearing that all my life and he hasn't come yet. Well, the Bible says he's coming and you can count on it because he said so. And in 2 Peter 3, 9, Peter talks about why Jesus hasn't come back yet. He said, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us who are not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now stop and think about it. God promised to Adam and Eve a redeemer. Genesis 3.15. It took him 4,000 years to get here. From the time that promise was made to the time when Jesus actually came, 4,000 years had passed. So where is the promise of his coming? They could, you could use that verse concerning his first coming. Where is the promise of his first coming? It took him 4,000 years to get here. Then he came and he was rejected. He was crucified, rose again from the dead. He went back to heaven and he said, I will come again. And it's been 2,000 years 
since he said that. So where is the promise of his coming? God moves slowly. And he moves slowly, but he's not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. He's long-suffering, the scripture says, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so the, uh, the very uh, sources of the dye for these animals all speak of Christ, just as the veil itself speaks of Christ. Now, we saw the darkness, and last week we saw the rending of the veil, part one, and today we're going to see the rending of the veil, part two. This veil that was colored blue, scarlet, and purple. And Matthew 27, verses 50 and 51, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. So the veil tore in two, torn by the hand of God, not from the bottom to the top, then the earthquake could have got the credit. It was torn from the top to the bottom. Now, Jesus is the Lord from heaven. The blue speaks of his uh, uh, heavenly, his deity. And he is our coming king. Here's the purple. But he died, first of all, he died for our sins, hence the scarlet. These were the colors inside the tabernacle, and we want to consider these three colors. First of all, the blue, declaring him to be the Son of God. The scarlet, declaring him to be the Son of Man. Now, when he became the Son of Man, he did not cease to be the Son of God. When he became the Son of Man, he did not become less the Son of God. He wasn't half God and half man. He was the God-man. He was all God and all man at the same time. And so we see the blue and the scarlet representing him as the God-man. And then the purple representing his royalty when he's the coming king. He's the God-man king and will be all at the same time. Now the next thing we want, us to, want you to consider is the robe that Jesus wore as he was beaten, as he was tried, beaten, and then brought to the cross where he was crucified. The robe is a very interesting, uh, very interesting thing. The robe, according to the Gospel of Matthew, the robe was scarlet in color. Matthew 27, 28 it says they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. So the robe, we are told, was red or scarlet. But in John, and as well as in Mark, we are told that that robe was purple. John 19, 2 says, And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. And the fifth verse says, Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. Well now, Matthew says the, word, the robe was scarlet, and John says the robe was purple. But in Luke, we read something else again. We read in Luke, And Herod with his men of war set him at naught, and mocked him, and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and said, sent him again to Pilate. A gorgeous robe. What, what color is a gorgeous robe? Well, the word gorgeous there is the Greek word lampros. And it comes from the same Greek word, which means radiant and magnificent and sumptuous. And the word itself, lampros, means bright, clear, gay, not modern, gay in modern connotation, Gay, goodly, gorgeous, and notice, white. This was a beautiful white robe that was put on the Lord Jesus. And this beautiful white robe was no doubt a very expensive robe. It was uh, a magnificent, gorgeous white robe. And they took it in mockery and they put it on the Lord Jesus. And that's what is recorded in the Gospel of Luke. 
Luke was not one of the 12 disciples. He wasn't there. But he records the fact that this robe was a magnificent white radiant robe. Uh, Matthew, on the other hand, he was there when Jesus was beaten and flogged. And Matthew tells us that this robe is scarlet, it's red. How did a white robe get to be a red robe? Well, the scripture tells us in Matthew 27, uh, 26, they rele then re released he Barnabas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. When the Romans scourged somebody, they used a, a little short whip, which was called a flagum. And maybe this could be where the word flogging comes from, I don't know. But this flagum had leather thongs on it, and these leather thongs contained pieces of broken glass or sharp stones, depending on how they wanted to make it. And when they would hit the person with that robe, it would instantly bruise and then rip the skin. And so when they, were, when they flogged Jesus or scourged Jesus, they turned his, his back and his body into literally raw meat. And the Bible prophesies this in the book of Isaiah. Notice there, Isaiah 52, 14. It says, many were astonished at thee. It says his visage, now his visage, that means his face. His face was so marred more than any man. Jesus didn't even look human from the beating that he took at the cross. And then it says, his form, this would be his body, his visage is his face, his form, his body, his form more than the sons of man. He didn't even look human. The, the uh, scourging and beating that he had to endure, all this is before the cross. And in Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, we read, he was stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. So Jesus was turned into a bleeding mass of humanity that did not even look human. And this gorgeous, magnificent, radiant white robe was, that was put upon him instantly was drenched with blood and became a scarlet robe. Every inch of his body was covered with blood. And this is all that Matthew saw. Because what did you know what Matthew did when he saw this? He took off. And so did all the other disciples except John. Mark 14, 50 says, they all forsook him and fled. So that's all that Matthew saw. He saw this robe become this scarlet colored robe and then he fled. But John, John was the only disciple that stayed with Jesus right on through the trial and the crucifixion itself. Peter was there for a while, he fled, and the other disciples, they were there for a while and they fled, but John stayed right with him. Now we know that because in John 19, we have Jesus speaking to John as he's hanging on the cross, he says to him, um, he says, to the disciple whom he loved, he saith to his mother, Woman, behold thy son. He saith to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. That was John. And so he entrusted the care of his mother to John as he was hanging there on the cross. So John was with him. John saw the whole thing. John saw more than any of the other disciples saw. And John was there when this robe was removed from Jesus so that they could crucify him. And by this time, this robe is purple, soaked and hardened with dried blood. And the scripture tells us in the Gospel of Mark, right down at the bottom of the page, Mark 15, 17, they clothed him with purple and plaited a crown of thorns and put it upon his head. And then in verse 20, it says, when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him and put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. And just taking that robe off the Lord Jesus must have been a terrible agony as that blood had dried, that, that white robe that had become red was now a purple colored robe, 
robe of dried blood, the scab the scabbed over, and they ripped that off of him. Must have been just in itself terrible agony. And the scripture says they took him and they crucified him. So the crucifixion robe is described for us as white, scarlet, and purple. The veil of the temple is described for us as blue, scarlet, and purple. Now there's a correlation there between the white and the blue. You know, the color blue is interesting because you read the Old Testament and the word blue is found in the Old Testament 50 times, exactly 50 times. But when you come to the New Testament, the color blue is not even there, not even once. Why would God mention the color blue 50 times in the Old Testament and never mention it in the New Testament? Well, there's a reason for it, because Jesus in heaven is depicted by the color blue in his heavenly home, the blue. But when he became a man, he came down to this earth, when the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us, he exchanges the blue for the white. He comes down as the spotless, sinless lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, a lamb without spot or blemish. And so as he left heaven and came down to earth, the blue is exchanged for the white here. Hence, the veil of the temple, blue, scarlet, and purple. But as Jesus comes to earth, it's depicted as the white, scarlet, and purple. Now the blue speaks of heaven and his deity. In the Old Testament, God is God in heaven. In the New Testament, God is here on earth. First, as the Lord Jesus for three and a half years, and secondly, as the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead that is here and indwelling every single saved child of God. So in the Old Testament, the color of God is blue. In the New Testament, the color of God is white. And you find references to that throughout the, uh, throughout the epistles. Now, going back to the Old Testament, God is in his heaven. And so we come to the tabernacle, and in the tabernacle is the ark, and the ark signifies the presence of God. And what did they do? They had to pack up the tabernacle every morning, take it on its journey for that day, then unpack it at night. And what, are, what were they told? God, God is very uh, strict about this. He said in the book of Numbers, when the camp setteth forth, in other words, <laughs> When they get ready to go each morning, because they wandered for 40 years through the wilderness, as they got set to go, Aaron shall come and his sons, and they shall take down the covering veil and cover the Ark of Testimony, that's the Ark of the Covenant, with it, and they shall put thereon the covering of badger skins and shall spread over it a cloth holy of blue. The Ark was to be, as it traveled that day, was to be covered over with a cloth of blue. What did that signify? God in his heaven. God is in his heaven. And Jesus is a type of the ark. Someday we'll get to the study of the tabernacle and you find the ark is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, there was other things in that tabernacle besides the ark. There was the table of showbread and the manna that was uh, uh, there upon, upon, or not the manna, but the, the bread, the unleavened bread, that was there upon it. And in Numbers chapter four, verse seven, we read, and upon the table of showbread, they shall spread a cloth of blue. Here's the cloth of blue again. And not only just on the table, but the cloth of blue was also to cover the dishes, the spoons, the bowls, the covers of the bowls, and the bread itself, all covered over with blue as it traveled that day signifying God is in his heaven. And then the candlesticks, the menorah. By the way, Jesus is the bread of life. That unleavened bread typified the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the true bread from heaven. 
Okay, it's covered over with blue. Why? Because Jesus was still up in heaven. Then we come to the menorah or the candlesticks. And when they are packed up for their journey that day, Scripture says, And they shall take a cloth of blue and cover the candlesticks of the light and the lamps and the tongs and the snuff dishes and the oil vessels themselves. Jesus is the light of the world. In the Old Testament, he's, it's covered with blue, signifying Jesus is still up in heaven. He hasn't come yet. So the ark, the showbread, the table, the menorah, all of these things, every day they had to be covered with blue. And then the golden altar of incense from which the incense, the fragrance, frankincense and myrrh and so forth was offered up unto God. When that altar was packed up every day, we read, and upon the golden altar they shall spread a cloth of blue and go on and cover it. Jesus is the sweet savor unto God. The wise men, you remember, they brought him gold, but they also brought him frankincense and myrrh, depicting the sweet fragrance um, that is reminiscent of the Lord Jesus his Christ. But it's covered with blue because Jesus is still in heaven. He hasn't come yet. And then fifthly, we come to the instruments of the ministry and all these other things that were in the tabernacle, they had to be packed up every day. And how were they to pack them up? We read in Numbers 4.12 that they would put them in a cloth of blue and cover them. And Jesus ministers before God daily for us right now. He's ministering in the tabernacle in heaven. He's making intercession for each and every one of us. And he is interceding on our behalf. He's our advocate. He is the one pleading our case as Satan accuses us. He's the, Satan is the accuser of the brethren. And Jesus is our great high priest that ever liveth to make intercession for us. And so the very instruments of the tabernacle were to be packed up and covered over with a blue cloth. All of this was done because Israel was not to forget the Lord of heaven. And God even told the Israelites to close their paganism, the styles of this world, but Israel was told to a certain degree how they were to dress. And in Numbers 15, 38, God tells them uh, talking about making the fringes on the border of their garments. And then he says, and they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. And Israel, Israel developed the prayer shawl because of this verse right here. Uh, it was easier than to take every single article of clothing, put fringe on it, and put a band of blue on it, it was easier to take the prayer shawl with the fringe on it and the band of blue and to take that and wear it every day. And that's what they did. And they put it across their shoulders and the fringe hung down. Each part of it was significant, but it was to remind them that God, they're not to forget the Lord. Even though the Lord is up in heaven, they're not to forget him. So this blue speaks of the Lord himself, the Lord in heaven. And the Israeli flag, when Israel became a nation in 1948, what kind of a flag did they come up with? Very significant, significantly, a blue and white flag symbolizing the presence of God. Uh, God was, was for his people. So blue, the blue speaks of the Son of God in heaven. And the white speaks of the Son of God on earth. And in the blue, we see his heavenly deity. But in the white, we see his sinless, spotless, earthly humanity. So these, these colors are all important. In fact, you can make a good case concerning Jesus and the colors of the spectrum. Um, because he's represented in the, in the colors of the spectrum in so many different ways. First of all, one of the colors of the spectrum is yellow, and that's the color of gold. And when you read about gold in the Old Testament, many times it's referring to the deity of Christ. 
and green, green is the exact middle color of the spectrum. And Jesus is represented in Revelation 2, uh, Revelation 4, 2 and 3, as sitting upon a, uh, a throne with a rainbow about the throne in sight like an emerald, an all green emerald, uh, all green rainbow surrounding his throne, and green is the exact center of the spectrum. Jesus is the center of everything. And he's represented there by the green. And then we come to the, the color blue, uh, showing his, he's the Lord from heaven. We come to the color white, that shows the sinlessness of the Son of God and his purity. Did you know that if you, if you mix all the colors together, it comes out white? Did you know that? The three primary colors, red, green, blue, put them all together, true colors, not different shades, but the true colors, they come out white. And that's interesting. You know why? Because the Bible says that. When you think of the colors relating to Christ, Colossians 2.9 says, In him was all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In him was all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The Godhead in bodily form is seen by all the colors of the spectrum. And... In the white, we see his earthly humanity, that he is sinless and he is spotless. In the red, we see his blood shed for us. And in the uh, sixthly, the, the purple, his royalty, the robe that they put on him, it began as white, was drenched in blood, became scarlet, and then became purple. And what does all this tell us? It tells us that he laid aside the blue of heaven. He put on the white for our sins and our sins turned it red. And he is coming back again as a king described by the color purple. Let me say that again. He laid aside the blue of heaven and he put on the white and he did it for our sins but our sins turned it red. And he is coming back again, not as a savior, but as king, hence the color purple. So we see Jesus depict in all of these colors. So the colors of the veil are there for a purpose. They have a spiritual gospel uh, message for us. And we read in the... Uh, in the um, uh, book of Isaiah, Isaiah 53, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. It's all, it's all about Jesus, but it was all for us. Now, going to the next page, the results of this veil ripping in two. This veil ripped in two by the hand of God had at least four tangible results connected with it. First thing, it made temple worship completely worthless. The temple worship became worthless. The Jews today, they have no temple, they have no altar, they have no sacrifice, they have no priesthood, and they have no veil. They have none of these things, and there must be a message here. I talked with a Jewish lady a number of years ago and showed her Christ from the Old Testament prophecies. And I said to her, what about your sins? And she says, well, our rabbi tells us that because we have none of these things, our rabbi tells us that we can have our sins forgiven by doing good, studying the Bible, and being a good neighbor, and so forth, doing good deeds. And I said, you know what? Your rabbi has no right to tell you that. God said, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. God said, the, it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. And you don't have the blood. You don't have a temple. You don't have an altar. You don't have a sacrifice. You don't have a priesthood. You don't have the veil. So 
what have you got? I said, you're still in your sins. And that lady accepted Christ as her, uh, as her own personal savior. But they have none of that today. So the temple worship became worthless when God ripped that veil in two. Now that veil was torn in two in the year 33 AD. 37 years later, 70 AD, all the rest of it, of the, uh, that list, ceased to exist. The temple was destroyed, the altar, everything was destroyed. The priesthood ceased to be. 70 AD, the Jews were driven out into, uh, into all the land. And so the results of that veil, it made the temple worship, Judaism, absolutely worthless. There's a message in this. The message is there's a new and better way to come to God and have your sins forgiven, and that's Jesus Christ. Secondly, it opened the access to God to whosoever will. That veil was ripped and the believer was put into the direct presence of God in the Holy of Holies. Hebrews 4.16 said, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We don't need the temple, the altar, the sacrifice, the priesthood, the veil. We need none of those things today because of the fact that we're exhorted to come boldly. We don't need a priest. You don't need a priest to get to God. All you got to do is come to God by Jesus Christ. There's one God and one mediator between man and God. That's the man Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2.5. He is our great high priest that ever liveth to make intercession for us. We need no priest. We need no priesthood. None of those things. Thirdly, when that veil of that temple was rent in twain, it ended the dispensation of law. In John 19.30, it, Scripture says, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. It is finished. The age of law is finished. It's over with. The veil has been torn in two. The believer is in the direct presence of God. He doesn't need a priest or a temple or an altar or any of those things anymore. It's over with. The dispensation of law is ended and we're living under the auspices of the grace of God today. In Mark chapter 15, it says, Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And that's when the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Notice in John, he said, it is finished, and he gave up, his go, uh, gave up the ghost. And in Mark it says, he cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. What he cried with that loud voice was, it is finished. And then in Matthew, it says he yielded up the ghost, and that's when the veil of the temple was torn in two. It shows, uh, and so it ended the dispensation of law. And the dispensation of law was triggered, the ending of the dispensation of law was triggered by God ripping that veil, making the two rooms into one room, the believer into the presence of God, don't need all that ritual and all that stuff anymore. And then fourthly, the fourth result of the rent veil, it shows us that the price of sin was paid for. God had paid the price of our sin. He died upon the cross and that death was sufficient for the elimination of all these things and the forgiveness of the child of God. Did you know that everything you do, if you're, if you're here this morning as a person that has never accepted Jesus as your savior, every single solitary thing you do is sin. Did you know that? There is nothing you cannot do that is not sin because the Bible says whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And everything that you do is sin, and so there's no way your good works can outweigh your bad works to get you to God. There's no way your good deeds can help you, budge you, inch you any closer to heaven. It, can't, it, it doesn't work that way. Look what the scripture says. The scriptures are the finest of final authority. Proverbs 28, 9, it says, his prayer shall be an abomination. A lost person can't even pray without sinning. And Proverbs 21, 4 says, the plowing of the wicked is sin. Plowing is an honorable profe uh, profession. It's part of the, uh, uh, you know, being a farmer, that's an honorable profession, but you can't even plow a field. 
without sinning. The plowing of the wicked is sin. Doesn't say the plowing of the righteous is sin. It's the wicked. Everything the wicked does is sin. Even just going to work every day is sin. And then the worship of lost people is sin. It's Proverbs 21, 27. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. And even the thoughts, the thoughts that we think in our heart are sin. Proverbs 15, 26. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord. And then finally, Proverbs 24, 9 says, the thoughts, thought of foolishness is a sin. So everything that the lost person does is sin. He cannot possibly work his way to God because everything he does, every breath he takes, every move he makes becomes sin. So the age of law ended and it ended with a shout. Matthew 27, 50 says, he cried again with a loud voice. He yielded up the ghost and the age of law ended. The temple, the veil in the temple was rent in two. Mark chapter 15, he cried with a loud voice. That's a shout. And Luke 23, it says, when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said, he gave up the ghost. Here's, here again it records, he shouted. There was a shout from the cross. It is finished. And you know what? That ended the age of law. But when the church age ends, there's going to be another shout. Another shout from heaven. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Age of law ended with a shout. The age of grace is going to end with a shout. And the tribulation period is also going to end with a shout, Revelation 16, 17, the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. There came a great voice out of the temple of heaven and from the throne saying, it is done. When Jesus died on the cross, his last words were, it is finished. And at his second coming, the word is going to come, it is done. And so each one of these ages ends with a shout from God, and the millennium begins. Now, if you're here today and you're not truly saved, we'd like to be a help to you. I understand that people many times are shy about seeking out somebody, so we have a little sheet on the back of the, of the note sh uh, sheet there. It says, I'd like some help, please. And if this is, this is your, uh, uh, the way you feel, just fill that out. Put it on your name, where you can be reached, and a good time to call. And I'll call you personally, and we'll talk about the, how to be right with God, how to know that you're saved, and what you must do to be saved according to the Word of God. Don't, we don't teach any man-made stuff here. It's all out of the Word of God. We'd be glad to be a help to you if that is your need. So um, feel free to, to do that. We look forward to hearing from you. Now, uh, next week, we're going to be looking at the third miracle of the cross. And we're, uh, the third miracle of the cross is the earthquake. Such an earthquake never was before. It's the next link in the chain of wonders that took place at the cross. This is the most discriminating earthquake that ever happened. You'll be amazed to see this earthquake and what happened as a result of it next week. Now then, if you stand with me, please, and we'll have a benediction together, and trust that you go this week rejoicing in, as you, think, as you see the various colors of that which is about us, see the, the prism of the rainbow itself, that all of that represents the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for coming. You are dismissed. May God bless each one.